inside the sales culture of the Commonwealth Bank. The emphasis is always on trying to get the maximum share of wallet out of each customer. They knew he was an easy target and they went for it. Everyday Australians taking on the nation's biggest bank. It's the CAN Bank. I've found that they can be deceptive, they can be misleading, they can certainly ruin your financial future. A modern David and Goliath classic, except that while David wins, he dies, and Goliath lives on to repeat his exploits. Welcome to Four Corners. Australia's four biggest banks now control 80% of the nation's financial planning industry, and they're fighting hard to dominate the private wealth sector, contributing billions to their profits. The public face of this hunt for fatter profits is the humble bank teller, and behind the teller, the financial planner. But when they ask if the bank can help you plan for your financial future, for your own sake, you have to ask what's in it for them. Indeed, you might liken a teller's job these days to the person behind the counter in a service station. You go to pay for petrol and they try to sell you confectionery and drinks. Tonight, we feature three families almost brought to financial ruin after the Commonwealth Bank steered them out of safe harbours into stormy seas without ever explaining the risks. When watching what is about to unfold, bear in mind that until Assistant Treasurer Arthur Sinodinas was recently forced to step down under questioning from the New South Wales anti-corruption body ICAC, the Abbott government had planned to soften the previous government's regulatory protection for consumers of financial services in favour of the big banks. That's on hold for now. Despite repeated requests, the Commonwealth Bank declined to be interviewed for this program. This report is a joint investigation by Four Corners and Fairfax Media. The reporter is Adele Ferguson. It's June 2012, a wintry afternoon in the beachside town of Shell Harbour in New South Wales. Inside this rented brick veneer cottage, Noel Stevens draws a menacing face on the window. Dad, why don't you tell everyone what you're drawing here? Why? Because I've got you on film. Look. Say hi. Hello. Noel is dying of cancer. He's high on morphine. His daughter Tegan is recording the last weeks of his life. Hello. Say I love you, my whole family. I love you, my whole family. <laughs> <laughs> it was never Noel's plan to end his days like this. Noel had a life insurance policy with the bank. When he was diagnosed, his plan was to use the money to buy a house for his last months, and that house would be left to his family. Smile! Dun, dun, dun. Exhausted just doing it. Smile. And they basically just turned around and said to him, no, your policy doesn't exist anymore you won't be getting any money. Did he feel robbed by the bank? Absolutely. Noel knew he couldn't beat the pancreatic cancer that would kill him. But in his dying days, he took on a legal battle and the opponent was almost as merciless. It was the Commonwealth Bank. Would this be one of the most important cases that you've battled? Oh, absolutely, there's no question about that. Um, it was a privilege, is the best way I can put it, for, to act for them. What do you think made him keep fighting? The need to provide for his family and, and simply that he felt it was wrong. A year before Noel Stevens was diagnosed with cancer, he was working as a scaffolder and living in Frankston, Victoria, caring for his invalid mother, Daphne. Noel had a watertight life insurance policy with Westpac a policy he'd had for seven years worth almost $300,000. It was guaranteed to pay him out if he ever got sick. Did your dad ever talk to you about uh, life insurance? No, not at all. He was already covered with Westpac, so he didn't need anything more. In early September 2010, the phone rang. It was the local Frankston Commonwealth Bank, 
inviting Noel to come in and speak with their financial planner. The role of the teller is to steer banking clients onto the planners, to provide opportunities. Um, and, and they're given targets for referrals each week. If the teller succeeds in getting Noel to see a financial planner and sign up for a bank product, he stands to get a bonus worth hundreds of dollars and the financial planner will get even more. Noel knew none of this. He walked into the Commonwealth Bank thinking that they were helping him, not that they were going to get commission, not that they were trying to do something for their own benefit. So a lot of people, what they don't understand is that uh, the teller will be looking up their details on the bank's information system, identifying if they could um, be uh, sent to a planner, if there were some opportunities there for the planner. Inside the Commonwealth Bank, the financial planner looks at Noel's details. Noel had few assets, less than $5,000 in his Commonwealth Bank savings account, no property, a small super fund, and his weekly wages went into his bank account. But Noel Stevens did have that Westpac life insurance policy. If Noel switched his policy to the CBA, it would be a win for the bank. The emphasis is always on trying to get the maximum share of wallet out of each customer. Take a seat At the Frankston CBA branch, Noel Stevens turned up for his 11.30 appointment with the bank's financial planner. You may be surprised by how affordable a financial planner really is. And what price would you put on the peace of mind that comes from having a plan? In fact, Known as the Wealth Management Division, a big part of their business is selling. Selling shares, property funds and insurance to their customers. This division manages $190 billion of customers' money. It's worth $743 million in profit a year to the bank. And helping to design a plan that helps you achieve your goals. Banks so now own or control up to 80% of the country's financial planners. The planners are actually being incentivised, or forced in a way, to give advice that's not in people's best interests. And the whole system is really structured to bring that about. Mr. Stevens, um, tell me about Inside the Frankston branch, the financial planner asks Noel Stevens a series of questions about his job, his financial status, and crucially, his medical history. Dad was just so trustworthy. He didn't think for one second that they weren't doing it for his best interests. Yeah, I do. You have? Noel is told he will get the same insurance protection as he receives from Westpac. This wasn't true. I was surprised that um, they were so quick to advise him to cancel one policy, which is Westpac, to move to another, um, because he had security there from that policy. And, and the reality is the difference between the, the Commonwealth policy and the Westpac one was not that huge. There's a very clear moral obligation and indeed fiduciary duty to make sure that you're not putting at risk what Mr Stevens had when you moved that policy. So I would have thought um, a greater degree of caution was required there in terms of going through those answers very carefully and making sure that you were not putting him in a situation where he'd be replacing a valid enforced policy with one that which the insurance company, as it turned out, turned around and said it's not valid. With Noel Stevens' life insurance policy now in the bag, it's a win for the bank. It scores a new policyholder and an annual premium of $1,482. The teller pockets a referral fee of $444.60 and the planner, he receives an $815 kickback plus an ongoing annual commission. What would happen to a planner if, if that planner didn't convince the customer, such as Noel Stevens, to swap from the Westpac life insurance policy to the ComBank insurance policy? Um, well, he, he wouldn't remain a ComBank financial planner for very long. Uh, if he didn't sell that policy to Mr Stevens, he would have had to have sold a policy to somebody else. 
Um, it's it's a sales culture. Look at the camera and say hello. Hey, hey, Nana. Hey, say Nana. it's recording. In 2011, Noel and his mother Daphne moved to a seaside community south of Sydney to live with Julie, Noel's sister, and to be closer to his daughter Tegan. He had moved into a caravan on his sister's property. He was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Noel was given six months to live. I just remember dropping the phone and just, just being absolutely devastated. From that moment, my whole world, life as I knew it, turned upside down. Noel, with only months to live, made a claim on the CBA life insurance policy, the policy he'd been encouraged to take, a policy that would pay Noel almost $300,000. He got a response from the bank two days before Christmas 2011. We didn't even feel like it was Christmas. It was such a, a black time. I vividly remember my dad becoming rapidly distressed and, you know, yelling at the phone. And I just remember him storming straight out the back and I knew something bad had happened. Something wasn't right. Noel had received a letter from the Commonwealth Bank telling him his policy was void. It had been rejected, with the bank claiming he had not been honest about his medical history. And they basically just turned around and said to him, no, your policy doesn't exist anymore. You won't be getting any money. It's like, well, what have I been paying into? Like, you know, my, that's my life insurance. I've been told I'm entitled to it. And when he got off the phone to them, he was just devastated. He just felt like he was beating his head against a brick wall, that they weren't listening to him. How can you even breathe when you've got children and you have an elderly mother and a sister and you don't own a house, you don't have anything? You don't even get your money. From the moment Noel Stevens lodged a claim, the bank ruthlessly investigated him. Those promises he would be better off quickly evaporated. A clause in his policy was used to trawl through his medical records to build a case that Noel Stevens had deceived them. The letter included extracts from his meeting with the planner. The questions required a yes or no answer. In the last five years, have you been advised or received counselling or treatment for alcohol or substance abuse? Answer, no. Actual position, you consulted the Frankston Medical Centre and the notes read as follows. 15th of November 2009. Drinks eight stubbies every night. Counselled about alcohol. Over the following months, the bank scrutinised his bank statements, including itemising his alcohol purchases from liquor outlets. Of course he loved a beer, but a beer and being an alcoholic are two worlds apart. What's no. Nanny doing? We're going to see Nanny. She's watching Elvis Smasley. Where is he? I can dance like him. Hey, look. <laughs> see, I can do that, Nanny. With a few months left to live, Noel Stevens was determined to fight for his money and his dream to look after his family. Mm, it's a good text. You are a deal. Hey, I wasn't the one just trying to impersonate Elvis Presley. No, I did. I didn't impersonate him. He took after me. <laughs> Noel and his family moved into a rental cottage and made an appointment to see a local lawyer, Martin Cullerton in Kiama. What was your impression of him? What, when you heard his story, what, what was your impression? Oh, immediately I felt that he was telling the truth. So, Tegan, please come this way. Thank you. Thanks. As Noel's health deteriorated and the pain became unbearable, 
Tegan went alone to see the lawyer. Martin Cullerton tried to reach a settlement with the bank over the $300,000 policy payout. The bank refused to settle. Why the bank didn't resolve it, because it wasn't that much money, I don't know, I can't answer that, but certainly it would have been a case that you would think that they, they could have done, shall we say. Okay. The Commonwealth Bank also continued to deduct monthly insurance premiums from his CBA bank account. And during this time that um, Noel was dying and, and you'd taken on the case, were they still taking out his premiums? Yes, they were. It was May 2012, and Noel was too sick to appear in court. Weeks away from dying, Noel was determined to see the case through. In his tiny living room, lying on the couch in his pyjamas, with nurses feeding morphine into his body, the bank's lawyers cross-examined him. And um, he just kept asking questions and then I, Dad just started bawling his eyes out and broke down and I just thought, how could you do that to someone like this? Like, I couldn't believe it. Days after the trial, Noel went into palliative care. He had become so sick that Tegan could no longer look after him. Noel had fought hard, but the cancer was about to beat him. Then the call from Martin came with news about his battle with the bank. Noel had won the case. He was in a coma-like state. And I got the call and I, I just remember thinking, I wish Dad was just awake. But I still, I went straight into palliative care and I got on his bedside and I was with Julie and she was there as well. And I just remember saying, like, you won. Everything's going to be fine. All the hard work you did, it's done. You won. Tegan and I were either side of his bed and I believe that he understood us um, and he tried to put, like, three fingers up. Um, I think he was trying to say, did he win the full amount? The court found that the Commonwealth Bank was negligent and demonstrated misleading and deceptive conduct. It said the financial planner did not act in Noel's best interests when he advised him to switch life insurance policies. It said commissions and kickbacks might have influenced his advice. The case was a big win for one individual taking on the deep pockets of the bank. This wasn't, however, a case where we can say that the financial planner you know, acted in a rogue fashion. This was a, almost a systematic type approach to it. On July 6, three days after winning the case, Noel Stevens died. As Tegan was organising his funeral, she received a call from Martin Cullerton that the bank had appealed the case. It's going to be very hard for me to trust anyone at any bank at any given time because they were just ruthless. They did not, they did not care at that point in time. They knew he was an easy target and they went for it. Two years before Noel was signed up for his life insurance policy with the bank, there was a financial planner working on Sydney's North Shore who was becoming increasingly uneasy about the sales culture at the bank. This train will stop at Chatswood. Jeff Morris worked as a senior financial planner at the Chatswood branch because it was a quick train ride to home. It was here Jeff worked with Don Nguyen, a man known by his colleagues as Dodgy Don. I first encountered a traumatised client in September of 2008, so about six months after I started there, and uh, they came into the branch uh, asking to see somebody else. In fact, I think they said uh, they thought he was a crook. Um, and the branch staff actually knew who it probably was. They were able to guess from that that it was probably Don. 
because um, the legend was so well established. In 2008, Don Nguyen was one of the bank's top planners. At the Chatswood branch, he had 1,300 customers who invested their money with the bank. He was uh, so high up, you know, we thought, oh, well, he has to be, um, you know, a good person to see. Yes. Don had pushed more than $100 million of customer money. And this star performer was rewarded with commissions and overseas trips by the Commonwealth Bank. It turned a blind eye to some of his practices. In 2007, Don Nguyen's legendary ability to sign up new customers scored him number one in the bank's internal financial planning league table. That year, Don signed up $39 million of customers' money for the bank, more than three times his target. Don's annual pay hit almost half a million dollars. In the same year, retirees Merv and Robin Blanche met Don Nguyen to invest their life savings of $260,000. He sort of told us how he'd done so well himself and how much money he had made and he sort of said we were losing money with the way we had our investments going. And by Merv Blanche worked hard all his life. He was also a keen cameraman. In 1961, when he was principal of Kula Central School in northwest New South Wales, he made a film of a typical school day. The film featured the Commonwealth Bank in the school. The Commonwealth Bank had always been the Blanche's bank. We'd taken our mortgage with our house with the Commonwealth Bank and we even had shares in the Commonwealth Bank. So the Commonwealth Bank was the way to go as far as we were concerned. And Robin, did you agree with that? Was it the oh, trust yes. factor? Yes, I trusted the Commonwealth Bank. At their meeting with Don, the Blanches told him they didn't want to be put into high-risk products. They said they wanted to live on $1,500 a month. A year later, things started to fall apart. Hello. It was November 2008, and the couple's investment had fallen by half which would squeeze their monthly living allowance. He asked us to come down to $1,200. Then he asked us to come down to $500. $500 a month to yes. live on? Yes, and then he asked us to come down to nothing. Goodness yeah. me, how, yes. how did you feel? Well, <laughs> devastated at the time, and we could see our investments were going down all the time, you know, from what we had. What the Blanches didn't know was that they were not alone. Financial planner Jeff Morris was discovering dozens of Don Nguyen's victims who were also losing their life savings. Jeff Morris had no faith the bank would do the right thing. In the case of Commonwealth Financial Planning, the system was set up to allow people to operate the way Nguyen did. It was not set up to provide quality advice to people. It was set up to push product and push CBA product, it's as simple as that. Warning bells were sounding inside the bank. A senior executive started to worry about compensation. During a conversation with Don's boss, the executive took notes. If we pulled Don out, huge compensation issue for Commonwealth financial planning. Better to work for clients' best interests to resolve all issues. We were told he'd been suspended for fraud and wouldn't be coming back, um, which seemed appropriate. Um, but then, um, all of a sudden, Don was returned and indeed promoted to senior planner. Uh, and so the other planners and I who'd seen some of these distressed clients, we realised something wasn't right. Over a beer with mates, Jeff Morris knew he had to act. It was at that moment that I realised that uh, if we didn't do something about it, that hundreds of clients uh, were going to have lost, you know, a third, half their capital uh, through no fault of their own. 
in fact these clients were going to be snowballed and duped and uh, that the bank would deny them compensation. Later that evening, Jeff wrote a letter to the corporate regulator ASIC. He outlined corruption and misconduct and how innocent people were losing their life savings. The letter, sent on October 30, 2008, also warned of a cover-up inside the bank. It was about a high-level cover-up at, at Commonwealth Financial Planning uh, to conceal the um, corruption, misconduct of uh, Don Noyan and to defraud the clients of compensation in the tens of millions of dollars. And you also mentioned that it was systemic, that it was a sales-driven culture. Don was a perfect storm that, that drove right through that, that loose structure and took it to the absolute nth degree, which is why his clients were more exposed than anybody else's. Um, but he wasn't, uh, he was by no means the Lone Ranger. It would take ASIC 16 months before launching a formal investigation into the bank. In the meantime, victims such as the Blanches would be forced to fight tooth and nail for what was rightfully theirs. Merv's camera recorded family life, his children, grandchildren and retirement. Hi, Merv. I know you love that. <laughs> but it didn't record the dark days of 2009 when the couple's life savings crashed by two thirds, forcing them onto Centrelink. We had been self-funded for 22 years. It seemed incredible that you could put over a quarter of a million dollars away and in a few months' time it had been eroded by two thirds. It just didn't seem possible. Their daughter, Marilyn Swan, became increasingly worried about her parents' mental and physical health. They had lost their dignity. They were now on a Centrelink payment to keep um, themselves financially afloat. Uh, they were humiliated, depressed. Dad had suffered some very serious health issues. And I felt that if I didn't step in, this had the potential to shorten their lives. As Robin and Merv searched for answers, a letter came from the bank, which sent alarm bells ringing. It said their money was not sitting in eight conservative bank products, but had been put into nine products, and most of them were high risk. This was the first uh, piece of honest communication, I guess I could say, that had come from their interactions with the CBA. Months later, another letter arrived that left them all gobsmacked. Marilyn, now quite the detective, responded immediately. The letter blamed their financial destruction on the GFC, and it believed the financial advice Don Nguyen had given them was appropriate. But the bank couldn't give them an explanation for how $25,000 of their money had turned up in a mystery ninth product. For Marilyn, the letter's closing paragraph was particularly galling. At the bottom of this letter, as an act of goodwill and as no admission of liability, um, they could find no reason why the $25,000 had been unauthorisedly uh, had been transferred without authorisation into this ninth product. And on the basis of that, they were offering $6,770 to settle without any further action. The Blanches at this point had lost $160,000, yet the Commonwealth Bank were offering a fraction in compensation. Yes, it was just over $6,000. But you lost we, more than $160,000. That's right. So, of course, well, we turned it down. We sort of said, that's not of no use to us, uh, having lost so much money. Marilyn was incensed. Merv and Robin had the good sense to keep a copy of all their documents. When Marilyn compared her parents' original statement of advice with the one the bank had sent, there were striking differences. This document had no footers. It contained several pages that weren't in the original documentation. And it also contained four tables that were not in the original statement of advice. So why do you think they were changing the tables? to um, minimise the liability of the bank to any compensation that we may seek. 
Once the bank realised the Blanches had kept the original documents, offers of compensation multiplied. Within six months, the bank had increased their offer from $6,777 to $95,000, but without admission of liability. We'd come a long way from $6,777, but it was a very hard road. And when we opened that letter, we had a discussion and we decided, take it. Take it because I don't think I can spend another year doing this. And so we settled. As the Blanches were reeling from their experiences with the Commonwealth Bank, there was an insider, Rod Gayford, who was feeling powerless. He worked at the bank's head office in Martin Place as a compliance officer. Rod's job was to make sure financial planners followed the rules. He previously worked for the corporate regulator for 26 years as an investigator and lawyer. He said the bank had good guidelines. They just weren't followed. CBA's got a robust um, a compliance manual, which I would say if you followed that particular manual, uh, you couldn't really go wrong, you know. They're, they're, they're all fairly similar, these compliance manuals, uh, but it's the degree to which they're followed. It's a, that, that's, uh, you know, the elephant in the room. Rod Gayford was well aware of Don Nguyen's antics, but his focus was on the conduct of another planner who he suspected was forging customers' signatures and putting them in high-risk investments for hefty commissions. Rod suggested the bank hire a handwriting expert. You need to engage the services of a, a proper expert that can give evidence in court. And did they take your advice? No. No, uh, there seemed to be some uh, problem about the, the cost. And do you recall what sort of costs we're looking at? Oh, would have been about $5,000. So that was too expensive? That was too expensive, yeah, yep. Yeah. As well as being denied $5,000 to investigate a possible forger, Rod was also frustrated by the lack of staff to police the planners. So the bank says it operates rigorous compliance and risk management framework. Was that your experience? No. I don't see how it could with only one and a half compliance officers. So in 2007 when you joined, there was really one and a half compliance officers yes, yes, across yes. the 700 planners and yeah. looking after 300,000 clients. Yeah, yeah. Rod Gayford lasted at the bank for less than two years. He felt powerless to do his job. And they were really toothless tigers in that organisation. And they had to be? Well, if they wanted to survive, yes. I suspect anybody who'd taken his job too seriously wouldn't have lasted very long. In July 2009, the Commonwealth Bank allowed Don Nguyen to resign, with Don citing medical reasons. Jeff inherited a few of Don's customers, including retiree Jan Braund. Neither Jan or the bank knew Jeff was the whistleblower. She demanded somebody with a few grey hairs, so I was probably the best qualified. I got a copy of her file straight away. Braun's husband, Alan, a former Qantas executive, was in the early stages of dementia when they met Don. They had trusted him with their retirement savings. It was a million dollars we wanted to invest, an extraordinary amount of money for two people who started out with absolutely nothing. Don Nguyen made himself available to the Brawns. This photo was taken by Jan at a meeting in a coffee shop in Chatswood. He put their money in high-risk CBA products where he would earn extra commission. By 2009, the couple's wealth had fallen more than 50% and Alan's dementia had taken over their lives. I just can't tell you how devastated I was. At that stage, I'm carrying a man that doesn't know who he is, where he is, what he is, where he's going, nothing. So that. And then to be told your financial future 
was absolutely gone. And I couldn't do anything about it. Jan, I've been through your file, and this is a very important document for you. It's probably the most important document in the whole file. It's an instruction that was sent to power planning back in 2002, and it makes it very clear down here mm. that you were a conservative investor mm -hmm. who wanted to preserve your capital. Absolutely. This note clearly states the Brawns had a conservative profile and they were extremely concerned and did not wish to use any of their capital in retirement. Jeff Morris had taken a copy of Jan's complete file before Don had left. Well, if it's any consolation, it seems like you weren't the only one. As far as I can make out, all of his clients were treated exactly the same. The note was Jan Braun's ammunition to fight for the hundreds of thousands of dollars she'd lost. But that didn't stop the bank trying to get away with paying as little as possible. $200,000 was offered. So he wrote back and said, that's not it, we're not playing that game. And they said they're now offered 215000 So we said, absolutely not. This is not an amount of money that you can do. You're robbers. Bank robbers, in fact. By August 2012, Jan agreed to an $880,000 settlement. The bank did not admit any liability. Inside the bank, it was a different story. Four Corners has found an internal document that was written two years before Jeff Morris warned the bank about Don Nguyen. It rated him a critical risk to the bank and his actions could attract a custodial penalty or criminal liability. If they had acted on this document, the trauma of hundreds of victims might have been spared. Last month, Jeff Morris and Jan Braund travelled to Canberra to appear at a Senate inquiry into ASIC's handling of the Commonwealth Bank's financial planning scandal. Originally, we set out to correct the wrongs of one planner. Very quickly, we realised it, it was an institution that had a problem. They hope the bank will finally be called to account for its behaviour, an ASIC to explain itself. Everyone was there to give evidence. Jan, Marilyn, Jeff, and a handful of executives from the Commonwealth Bank, including its lawyer, David Cohen. Senator Mark Bishop, the chairman of the inquiry, took particular issue with the bank's submission to the Senate, which labelled the advice of Don Nguyen and other financial planners as inappropriate. Do you think inappropriate advice captures the seriousness of what occurred here? the fraud, the doctoring of files, the lying to clients, the cheating, the oversight, lack of oversight by senior executives. Is inappropriate the exact correct description? Um, inappropriate covers the fact that some of the behaviours, which I think you're alluding to, uh, from some of our people just were not the appropriate behaviours, were not the behaviours that we expect today. In my mind, inappropriate is not systemic fraud. It's not systemic theft. It's not lost caused by systemic bad behaviour. You know, when my three-year-old writes on the wall, that's inappropriate and you tell her off. This is not inappropriate. Inappropriate is not the word here, is it? Well, Senator, we believe it is. As the day moved into evening, it was then ASIC's turn. An army of commissioners readied themselves for a grilling by the senators. It was 16 months before you actually addressed the whistleblower's concerns. Isn't that dragging the whole program out longer with, with you not being for not making contact with the whistleblowers and acting on their information. Yeah. When we got that contact from the whistleblowers, we should have been back in contact with them seeking more information. I think we'll all agree away. with that. Well, I think, I think you have ASIC offered a mere culpa of sorts. 
And then the chairman asked a question of Jeff Morris that should send a chill through executives at the Commonwealth Bank. When we come to uh, make our recommendations, is the evidence you've heard sufficient that we should recommend that there be a full, properly independent review of all those client files? Absolutely, and I suspect a broader review is just going to uncover there are, there are um, a lot more, like you know, tens of thousands of clients who are probably entitled to compensation, and it's never been looked at. Right. Thank you for your assistance today, and I hope you are able now to uh, move on, and I hope we are able to do the job. There was one key witness missing from this inquiry, Don Nguyen. Don Nguyen was a hard man to track down. We managed to film him outside his family's dry cleaning business south of Sydney. He was having a cigarette. When Don left the bank, he lodged a claim through Cominshaw, the same division that refused to pay Noel Stevens $300,000. He went on sick leave. The bank didn't even make him, didn't sack him. Now here he is, a man with a possible criminal intent here, and the bank is sort of patting him on the head, saying, there, there, darling, go off on sick leave. You, I'm so sorry, you're depressed. It's almost five years since he resigned. So far, Don has received more than $300,000 from Cominshaw. He can only get the full amount if he's too sick to work. Don was at home in his Newtown Terrace in Sydney's Inner West when we tried to talk to him. Don, is it possible to talk to you? He refused to open the door. Later, when we were driving away, he phoned. He showed no remorse and it was hard to get a word in. Don, Don, can, can I interrupt you for a second? Can Don I... said he'd can done I... nothing wrong. He was never trained nor reprimanded. And the advice he gave was within the Commonwealth Bank guidelines. You were never pulled aside. But, but he also you, claimed his customers knew what they were signing. You resigned in, in 2009 um, and on stress leave. And I've been told that you're still getting um, an insurance policy claim of about $80,000 a year. And um, I just wanted to confirm that that's correct. He ignored my question. And I just want you to answer the question. Are, are, you, are you working at the dry cleaners? He hung up. He didn't want to answer the question. Last year, Don Nguyen went with his wife and daughter on a tropical island holiday to the Maldives. A holiday a man like Noel Stevens only dreamed about. Come and I'll show you my boat. It's my boat over here. Oh yeah, Dad bought a new boat, everyone. There it is. Noel never bought his boat but he did win the appeal against the Commonwealth Bank. Noel's family will finally get the $300,000 they were entitled to. But they had to put us through all of that. And Dad never even got to see that money. Never even got to see it. The Commonwealth Bank says it has now cleaned up its act and got rid of rogue planners like Don Nguyen but it was no rogue planner who so badly advised Noel. It's the can bank. I've found that they can be deceptive. They can be misleading. They can certainly ruin your financial future. They can cover up and they can go out of their way to make life extremely difficult for you. It becomes a very much a uh, David and Goliath battle. One last word on Goliath. The Commonwealth Bank's last full year profit was a record $7.8 billion, and that's about to get another boost. I should emphasise that both the Commonwealth Bank and ASIC refused to be interviewed for the program. The Commonwealth Bank did provide a statement regarding their treatment of Noel Stevens. It says, quote, We acknowledge that the most appropriate action in this case would have been for the customer to have remained with their existing policy. The full response is on our website. Next week on Four Corners, Pakistan's Hidden Shame, 
the shocking sexual exploitation of thousands of young and vulnerable children. Until then, good night.